In 1995, the third Warner Brothers Batman movie came out in the form of Batman Forever. And now things were a little different. Tim Burton and Michael Keaton were gone and replaced by Joel Schumacher and new Batman Val Kilmer, along with Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face, Jim Carrey as the Riddler, Chris O'Donnell as Robin, and Nicole Kidman as Dr. Chase Meridian. This time around, Burton's dark and gothic twisted psychological pantomime has been replaced by an abundance of bright colours, neon lights, and Jim Carrey being, well, Jim Carrey. Batman Forever was a big hit when it came out, making nearly $100 million more than its predecessor, Batman Returns, in the box office. But in the modern day and age where everyone likes their Batman movies dark and brooding, Batman Forever often gets paired off with its embarrassing brother, Batman and Robin, as being a silly, misguided Batman movie. One that takes a step backwards into the campy territory of the 1960s. But today we're going to explore the original script and some of the deleted scenes that didn't make it into the final movie to see if underneath all the flashy colours and Jim Carrey, if there was a dark, serious Batman movie in there somewhere. Riddle me this, could there have been a very deep and powerful Batman movie hidden somewhere deep within Batman Forever's DNA? Well, today we are going to find out. The original script of Batman Forever, which was actually called Batman 3, was written by what I think was a husband and wife writing team called Lee and Janet Batchelor in 1993, just one year after the release of Batman Returns. And so, we're going to check it out. So, let's check it out. So as we all know, in the original cut of Batman Forever, the movie starts with a dark and stormy night at Arkham Asylum, where a Dr. Burton has discovered that dangerous inmate Harvey Dent, otherwise known as Two-Face, has escaped, while writing on his cell wall, the bat must die in blood. It's actually quite a dark and gothic opening, and feels more like something we would have seen in the Burton Batman universe. Interestingly, in the very first script, the structure of the story is completely rearranged to how we see it in the final film. In the final movie, we start off with Batman getting ready for action in the Batcave. Insert drive through joke. Batman then battles Two-Face and his goons at the Gotham Bank, which leads to the helicopter fiasco, which results in the helicopter crashing into the Lady Gotham statue, which is then followed by Bruce Wayne arriving at Wayne Enterprises, where he meets an obsessed Edward Nigma. Bruce then spots the bat signal, where he is then transported to the Batcave via a secret tunnel connected to his office at Wayne Enterprises. And when he suits up and gets to the bat signal, he discovers that it was Chase Meridian who used the signal. Because she's horny or something? Now the original script has these scenes, but they're all jumbled. In the original script, we start with Two-Face escaping from Arkham. We then get a flashback sequence of Bruce as a kid running around the grounds of Wayne Manor, where he falls through a hole in the ground into what would become the Batcave, where little Bruce is absolutely terrified of all the bats, where his father eventually comes down to save him. This is almost beat by beat the same as the flashback sequence seen in Batman Begins. Older Bruce then wakes up on his private jet, suggesting that he was dreaming. His private jet is on its way to Wayne Enterprises. We then get the Wayne Enterprises scene where Bruce meets Edward. Bruce sees the bat signal, he uses the secret tunnel to the bat cave, where he then has his battle with Two-Face and his goons at the bank. Oh, and the bit where Batman is holding onto the chain that's dangling from the helicopter was way more brutal in the original script, where Two-Face crashes Batman through buildings and, and smashes him into cars. There was even an animatronic hot dog billboard advertisement of a boy chewing on a hot dog, and the sign was mechanical and actually chewed. And Batman got caught up in the sign and chewed by it a little bit as well as another giant advertisement, which was a giant coffee cup full of recycled coffee, which Batman falls into. And after the helicopter crashes into the face of Lady Gotham, Gotham City is actually really pissed off about it, and a TV debate takes place on a talk show. 
with many people on the show believing that Batman causes more harm than good. And Chase Meridian is part of the TV debate, and is the only one defending Batman. I think in the original script, it was written with Michael Keaton in mind, as one of the early scripts describes Bruce as now having a few more wrinkles and being slightly older, which is a far cry from the more fresh-faced Val Kilmer. The original cut of Batman Forever really does a deep dive into Bruce Wayne's identity crisis. A huge part of Bruce's journey this time round was questioning if he should continue to be Batman. Does being Batman lead to more negative outcomes than it does positive ones? This tortured Bruce Wayne is riddled with guilt. He feels guilty for his parents' death, as they went to a movie theatre at Bruce's insistence. He feels guilty for Harvey Dent becoming Two-Face, because he wasn't able to save him in time from having acid thrown into his face. And finally, he feels guilty for the death of Dick Grayson's parents. There is a scene later on when Batman is talking to Dr. Chase Meridian, and she asks him, who is he? And he replies that he doesn't even know anymore. And to add to his guilt and shame, there was even a deleted scene from the final cut where the media is blaming Batman as they see him as the cause for all the costume villains running amok in the city, and a news anchor literally pleads with Batman to give up. In order to save the day, Bruce must explore the darkest resources of his mind and face his fears, and embrace them, so he can accept that not only is he Batman, but he's Batman forever. Hence the famous scene of Bruce Wayne embracing the giant bat creature, of which in the script, this bat creature is described as being the dark side of Bruce's persona. And I think it's a shame that all these intellectual subplots were removed, as it takes this movie down very interesting twists and turns, and it makes sense for the movie to be called Batman Forever. I can't help but feel like this psychological subplot was removed because it clashed with the movie's cartoonish nature that we see in other scenes. So let's talk about the villains. Firstly, in the original script, Two-Face is way more interesting and complex. The script version really does go into his schizophrenia and multiple personality syndrome. It is like there is literally two people in there. There's Harvey Dent who can be reasonable, and Two-Face who is evil and ruthless and has no problem killing people. And often Two-Face can slip in and out of his two personas. At the bank scene where the bank guard is all tied up when Harvey Dent is flipping his coin, Harvey actually starts to feel sorry for him and even offers him some of the loot. To which one of Two-Face's goons is like, Hey boss, you can't do that. To which Two-Face then strikes at the goon and starts choking him. Yeah, in this version, Harvey is unstable and is really all over the place as he's in a constant battle with himself. What I find fascinating is in the script, his lair is the same as what we see in the final movie, with it split in the middle, with one side looking heavenly and the other side looking hellish. But in this version, if Harvey steps into the hellish side, Two-Face comes out. But if he's on the heavenly side, he's Harvey. The duality of the character is kind of why Harvey needs a coin to decide things, because there is a conflict going on between his two personalities. Whereas in the final film, he just keeps flipping the coin till he gets the result that he wanted, which kind of goes against its purpose. Also in the final film, they removed his dual personality, and he basically just did a Jack Nicholson as the Joker impersonation. Oh, and Two-Face's girlfriends in the original version aren't called Sugar and Spice, but Lever and Lace. Also in this old version, Two-Face even taunts Batman that he is the same as him, as he has two identities and literally wears two faces, which reflects on Bruce's guilt and identity crisis. I like this early promotional photo of Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face, but I do wonder if this was an early makeup test because this looks slightly different to how he looked in the movie. One, he's wearing a different suit that he never wears in the film, and two, his Two-Face makeup looks less pink and has more of a silver tint. I actually honestly prefer this look to the one we got in the film. It looks cooler, slicker, and more subtle. Now, if Two-Face in the original script is better than the movie version, then damn, the script version of the Riddler, in my opinion, isn't too great. All I can say is that I'm really glad for Jim Carrey coming in and rubbing in some of his own personality into the character. 
as in this original script, there are some really campy scenes. Like when Bruce and Chase go to the charity circus, the Riddler, who isn't quite the Riddler yet, disguises himself as a leprechaun fortune teller and reads Bruce's fortune to him and tells him that there is a big question mark in his future. You know, aka the Riddler. Yeah, look, I wasn't a fan of that. That's like something from Adam West Batman. In the original script, the character wasn't even called Edward Nigma, but Lyle Heckendorf. Although later on when he sends Bruce the riddles, sometimes he signs them as the Riddler, and other times he signs them as E. Nigma. Yeah, it gets confusing. It's like, come on, pick a name already. Are you Heckendorf, Nigma, or the Riddler? Now, his mind box device wasn't just meant to enhance audience TV viewing experiences, although that does eventually happen. But in the original script, it's kind of like The Matrix. The original intention for the box device was so information can be downloaded into people's minds. So if you need to learn a new language or need military training, all that information can simply be plugged into your mind, which is actually a really fascinating concept. And the Riddler actually has a physical transformation, like the Joker and Catwoman before him, in that he downloads a program into his mind to make him smarter. But a crossword puzzle program accidentally got added to the information being zapped into his head, which fills Heckendorf's mind with question marks. Yep, he's literally possessed by question marks in a weird way. One thing I do like about the script version of the Riddler is that he is more of a threat because he becomes so smart. His capabilities are actually kind of limitless. He just becomes an evil, powerful absorber of knowledge and intelligence, which in essence could make him more powerful than any of Batman's other villains. He even becomes godlike with there being no bounds to what he can do and learn and absorb. But no, in the final film, he plays bomb baseball in the Batcave and grabs his riddle nuts. The script also explores the Riddler's loneliness and how he longs for friends and to be popular like Bruce Wayne. Basically, in Gotham City, everyone loves Bruce Wayne. And wherever Bruce goes, people just flock to him and just love and adore him. Whereas Heckendorf is so socially isolated and neglected of human contact, he really longs for that. There are times where he sees people just adoring Bruce and just really wishes that he could have that, kind of making him really tragic. So with the character's description, you're probably thinking, what's my problem with the Riddler? He sounds interesting. Well, I think it's just the way he was originally written. To me, he just didn't have any flair and his dialogue was bland, with him doing weird things like, as mentioned, dressing up as a fortune teller and reading Bruce's future. Also, how did Bruce not recognize him? Heckendorf has a landlady who hassles him for rent. He invites her into his apartment, where he plugs her into his mind machine, which kind of puts her into a euphoric dream state. He is able to read her mind, where he looks into her intimate fantasies. Some of them include Dobermans and Goldfish. Ugh, yuck, and I'm not even kidding. Someone call animal protection on this lady. Yeah, I don't need to guess why that was removed. This whole idea of the Riddler's brain drain box putting people into a euphoric dream state is actually a big deal in the original script. As in this script, the mind box is kind of seen as being like a drug. It puts people in a euphoric psychedelic state, and when they get plugged in, they just want more. This idea of the Riddler's mind box being like a drug was also explored in the comic book adaptation, where after using the box, the Riddler and Two-Face seemed pretty zoned out, where Two-Face said, my god, Jim Morrison was right about everything. And connecting to the box is even referred to as having a hit. And the whole city gets hooked on this box, to which the Riddler feeds off the minds of Gotham City, with people's minds becoming one sentient beam of power and knowledge, with it being beamed straight into the Riddler's head, which makes his head actually start to distort and get bigger from his brain growing from all the knowledge that he's gaining. In fact, Two-Face is so hooked on the device, he even threatens to kill the Riddler and just keep it for himself. There were some deleted scenes that also display the Riddler's more sinister side. Firstly, there's the scene where Batman enters the salon, where everyone starts laughing at him. Now, without any context, this scene doesn't really make any sense. 
but Batman went to the salon because he was trying to track down the Riddler and Two-Face while they were on their Gotham robbing spree. And the Riddler hacked into Batman's database and gave him the wrong location of the crime, that being the salon. And then there's this photo of the Riddler putting Chase Meridian to sleep by way of giant syringe. I remember seeing this in the Batman Forever movie magazine and felt that it kind of looked really freaky. I mean, that syringe looks nasty. I'm guessing this was cut because it wasn't very child friendly. Of course, Batman Forever finally introduces Robin, and he's pretty much written exactly how we see him in the film. There isn't too many differences, except in the original script, he's described as being 16 years old. Whereas in the movie, I always felt that he came across as being about 25. And if the final film was tough enough that he was now given a brother who was murdered, but in the original script, he also had two younger sisters. Dick becomes Robin quite early in the script. At that scene where Dick saves Batman from being buried alive while wearing his circus outfit, in the original script it was a brawl on a train, and Robin even fights some of the thugs. And at the end of the scene, Commissioner Gordon shows up along with other cops and media, and asks who is this guy fighting with Batman? Where Batman says, well, he's Robin. And that's it, he's now Robin. Where then afterwards, Bruce starts training Dick. But it's actually Dick's fault that the Riddler and Two-Face discover that Batman is Bruce Wayne, as the Riddler recognizes Robin from the circus. Remember, in this original script, the Riddler was also at the charity circus when he was disguised as a leprechaun fortune teller. And thus, they learn that he's staying with Bruce. So, Bruce must be Batman. Wow, Robin has only been Batman's sidekick for like five minutes and already it's led to his identity being revealed, which is when the Riddler and Two-Face break into Wayne Manor. Just as with Robin, I feel like Dr. Chase in the script was pretty much the same as what we got in the movie. In the script, Bruce Wayne immediately has the hots for Chase, and Bruce even has some kind of spyware technology via phone cables or something like that, where he goes to use it to spy on Chase at her home, which is kind of creepy, but thankfully Alfred calls Bruce out on this and tells him to find another way to see Chase, which leads to Bruce making an appointment to see her about the riddles that he's been receiving, which then leads to the circus scene. Also, when Bruce and Chase attend Heckendorf's event gala, it's not Bruce that gets plugged into the Riddler's mind box, but Chase Meridian, as she's transported into what looks like a black and white 1930s movie, where she starts dancing with Fred Astaire. When Batman and Robin go to the Riddler's Island to stop him and Two-Face once and for all, Batman gets trapped in a sort of psychedelic funhouse where he must get through a maze of mirrors and is then bombarded by digital projections of his parents being murdered, like he is physically stuck there watching it, as well as projections of his previous villains, including the Joker, Penguin and Catwoman. Two-Face confronts our heroes on a beam up high in the Riddler's booby trap. In the final film, Batman throws a heap of coins at Harvey when Harvey does his coin toss, which causes him to fall to his death. Now, in this version, Harvey simply flips his coin and just sort of loses his balance and falls to his death. And yeah, that was it. He just clumsily falls. When Batman discovered Edward, or in this case Lyle, all curled up after his brain machine is destroyed, the script explains that Bruce thinks that Lyle comes off as such a pathetic creature, he actually kind of pities him. And of course Heckendorf is now insane and is sent to Arkham Asylum. I actually really like this early script. Apart from the way the Riddler's dialogue was written, I found that it had some really interesting ideas, and it really got quite psychological. Now there is supposedly a longer, darker cut of Batman Forever, and maybe that maintains some of this original script. But either way, this script was really good, and really peels the layers of Batman's psyche. Had this version been made, I think it would have been a very surreal, and dreamlike Batman movie. The script was definitely about identity, and facing your fears, and embracing who you truly are. And it also explored the healing process by letting go of trauma. Really positive messages like that which I really appreciate, creating a very mature story. Which is interesting considering the final movie was a little bit immature. And so, this original script concludes with Chase asking Alfred if Bruce Wayne being Batman ever ends. To which Alfred replies, No, not in this lifetime. 
Because once again, Batman forever. Look, I don't think that Batman Forever is in any way as bad as Batman and Robin. I actually do think it's a very fun movie, in a sort of Power Rangers kind of way. Every now and then I'll watch it, and the movie never fails to put a smile on my face. But I do think it's a shame that more elements from the original script, and even the original cut for that matter, weren't used. As although we did end up with a fun, guilty pleasure Batman, we could have gotten a very unique, and superb Batman movie. Anyway, I'm Minty, and please release the dark cut. See ya!